uh, we are concluding our sermon series entitled, The Church, Let the Revolution Begin. How many believe the revolution's already started? <laughs> Is it a significant time that we're living in or what? Have you been watching all this footage over Dr. Billy Graham? Isn't it amazing? I mean, we know that this great man of God has reached thousands and thousands and thousands of people uh, with the gospel in his lifetime. But you know what? I wouldn't be surprised that he's not reaching even more with his death. Isn't that amazing? I mean, everywhere you turn on to and the Internet and you look on Facebook, there's something about Billy Graham. I believe tonight there's a special on Fox or something. There's a special tonight about Billy Graham, and so it's just amazing. And I think these are exciting times. I think there is a mantle that is being passed on to the next generation. How many would say amen? And so we need to grab hold of this mantle, amen, this evangelistic mantle that Dr. Billy Graham represented. And we're going to get the gospel out to the four corners of the earth. How many would say amen? And then guess what? Jesus can come back, all right? But uh, I'm excited, and uh, I'm excited about this series. I hope you've enjoyed this series as much as I have. So one more time, please turn with me to the book of Matthew, the 16th chapter. The Gospel according to Matthew, chapter number 16, is where we will find our opening text this morning. And I hope after this series that we will never look at this passage of Scripture the same way again. I hope that every time we read it, we will be reminded of this series and the things that the Holy Spirit has revealed to us. But when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that you are John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But Jesus said unto them, Who do you say that I am? In other words, who is Jesus to you? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Everybody say, Right answer. <laughs> right answer. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, the rock of revelation of who Jesus really was, because the church is not built upon man. Can somebody say thank God? Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Pastor Victoria, I'm going to ask that you stand and pray. Ask God's blessing over the word today and our ears to hear and our hearts to be attentive. Pastor we thank you, Lord God, for another chance to be able to gather in your house this morning. And God, we ask that the, the word would fall on good ground. God, I pray that you would open up our ears, open up our eyes, our heart, God, to receive. Everyone said, amen and amen. So for review's sake here this morning, in message number one of this series, we talked about the fact of how the church was God's idea. It was God-ordained. It was Holy Ghost-breathed. And then in message number two, we talked about the making of a revolution and how true repentance will birth this revelation into existence which, by the way, is not the next move of God, but the next move of the church. Amen? For years we've been sitting back waiting on God to move when all along He's been waiting on you and I. And then in message number three, we described who the revolutionaries are, who they are and their place, their authority in this great revolution. And so then that takes us here this morning, and the title of this fourth and final message of our series is this, Creating a Revolutionary Culture or Climate. How do we create a revolutionary culture or climate? I believe a true life-changing revolution 
not only requires revolutionaries, but it requires a new way of thinking, a new mindset. How many understand that old wine skins cannot contain new wine? Right? Probably need to write that down right there. Old wine skins cannot contain new wine. And when I say old, I'm not talking about a generation or an age. I'm talking about a mindset. People who are used to or accustomed to things going a certain way. Old wine skins cannot contain new wine. But we need a new, a fresh mindset. It requires for us to admit that we have sometimes missed the mark and fell short of the intended target. Last week in our message about the revolutionaries, we brought out how Jesus' teaching and even his behavior were so anti-establishment. They were very anti-religious. In fact, they made the religious people of his day very upset. Can I tell you the very same religious spirit that was present in Jesus' day and in control is alive and well here today? Isn't that amazing? The more things change, the more they stay the same, right? (laughs) And like we have said so many times in this series, the church has become so religious so much so that we mirror the very same religious movement of Jesus' day. And how was that religious system so strong and so prevalent? Number one, they didn't recognize who Jesus was. Now, how many know that's bad enough in itself? But what's even worse than that is number two, they crucified Jesus. Religious people. What today we would call the church. My God, help us, Jesus. We've become so religious, especially in America. We have a form of godliness, but we deny the power thereof, right? We go to church on Sunday morning because it makes us feel better about who we are as a person. Eases our conscience. We've done our duty, right? So then we can go out and do whatever we want to Monday through Saturday. But in the American church especially, we've learned how to do church. And many of us do church really well. We put on the church clothes. We say the church things. We do the part. We go through the motions. We do church really well, but yet we struggle at being the church. We struggle at being those revolutionaries. We struggle at creating a revolution in the society that we live in. We struggle at being the church. And with that being said, let me say this. Even though the devil will try to keep us away from the house of God, if the truth be known, the devil doesn't really care if we go to church just as long as we don't become the church. In fact, even good church services don't really scare the devil as long as it stays within the four walls of the building. Right? But what really scares the devil and what really motivates the kingdom of darkness into retaliation mode is when the church takes it to the streets. Come on, somebody. What really causes the enemy to begin to fight us is when the church stops settling for just good services. Oh, my goodness, we had a good service this morning. Well, what are we going to do about it? How's it going to change us? What really causes the enemy to begin to fight us is when you and I, the church, stop settling for just good services. What causes the devil to really fight us is when we start living out the life of Christ on a daily basis. When we take our church clothes off. Come on, somebody. So in this closing message of our series here today, I want us to look at a passage of Scripture found in Philemon, chapter number 1. Chapter number 1, verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, and to Philemon, our brother, 
dearly beloved and fellow laborer. And to our beloved Aphia and Acabus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So here in this salutation from the Apostle Paul as he addresses Philemon, who was, by the way, a leader in the Colossian church. We see here that in verse number 2, Paul says, And to the church in your where? To the church in your house. Notice he didn't say to the church uptown or to the church down the street or to the church on the block, but he says to the church in your house. Now, oftentimes when we make this reference or this statement, we're talking about the Word of God or the Spirit of God. Let me show you this. Oftentimes we will say, as Christians, not only do we need to be in the Word of God, but we need for the Word of God to be in us. How many would say amen? And not only do we need to be in the Spirit, but we need the Spirit of God to be in us. How many would say amen? And so the same is true about the church. Not only do we need to be in the church, but we need the church to be in us. The church isn't something we do. The church isn't something, isn't a place we go to. The church is something we are. Remember, it's not an organization. It's an organism. Living, breathing, walking, talking. The body of Christ. We need to have the church residing in our house, in our homes, in our marriages, in our relationships, in our families. The reason why the world is in such a mess is because the church doesn't re reside there. The church resides in a building that we only go to once a week. We need the church. We need to be in the church, and the church needs to be us. Because remember, what is the real definition of the church? If you'll remember from the previous messages, the church is not just the body of Christ, which is a great thing, but we are also the house of prayer. The house of prayer. Let's look at it here in Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. This is what Jesus said about his own house, his own church. Matthew 21, verse 12, a very familiar passage of Scripture. And Jesus went into the what? Temple, which would be considered the church back there. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And he said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of what? House of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Wow. Now let me say this about this very dramatic occurrence that took place in the temple. I think what frustrated Jesus the most wasn't just the sale of animals in the temple, which they could have done outside, or the price gouging that was taking place, although I believe he was opposed to both. But I think what Jesus was really angry about was the fact that with all the commotion of buying and selling in the temple, people were being robbed of the opportunity to pray. There was so much commotion going on. Well, I need this, I need that, I need to bring this sacrifice. Here, here's my money, here, give me that. Da, 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 da. What happened? The people were robbed of the opportunity to meditate, to concentrate on Jesus, and to pray. Think about it. How many of us as individuals have packed our schedules so full that now all we have is very little time to pray. Guilty as charged. And the same can be said about our church services as well. Most church services in America are so scripted. 
so planned out, so orchestrated, and so full, so full that they're empty. So full that they're empty. They're so scripted and orchestrated and so full that now we don't even make time to pray in the house of God. Let me ask you this. If we don't learn to learn to pray in the house of God, where are we going to learn to pray at? Church, can I tell you that good is an enemy to that which is best. We do good church in America, but there's a better way. I said there's a better way and it's God's way. There's no doubt that most of the time we come into our churches and we have good worship and we have good music and we have good services. But where's the mourner's bench? Where's the weeping? Anybody old enough to remember when they used to weep and wail in the house of God? Where's the weeping? Where's the wailing? Where's the travailing? Where's the intercession? My God. Where are the intercessors? Where are the prayer warriors? Where are the Helen Ackersons? Where are the Hattie Waddles? Where are the praying hides? No, we come into the house of God to be entertained. Why? Because it's all about me. Pastor Steve, Pastor Josh, Pastor Victoria, what can you do for me today? Lift me up. Encourage me. Build me up. Look at your neighbor and tell him, it ain't about you. It ain't about you. Where's the travailers? Where's the intercessors? Where's the prayer warriors? Where's the mourner's bench? Where's the altar? I'm convinced that we will never pray at home like we should until we first start praying in the house of God. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of what? A house of worship. A house of signs and wonders. A house of supernatural. A house of healing. A house of hope. No, a house of prayer. A house of prayer. And then, once it becomes a house of prayer, then all those other things will begin to happen. The hope, the healing, the restoration, the whatever we need. but it all takes place through prayer. Prayer. How many understand everything we do as the church must be birthed out of prayer? But in our infinite technology and wisdom of today, we think somehow we can bypass, bypass prayer. We think that we have figured it out and we have done church good enough that we don't need to pray anymore. You ain't going to shout me down. Come on. So I believe it's time for a revival of prayer. A revival of prayer. How many believe a revival of prayer needs to be birthed in the house of God? Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. Help us to wait upon you. Help us to push back the plate. Turn off the computer. Turn off the TV. Come on, somebody. Forget about the ball game. Forget about the mall. How bad do we want it? How, how much are we willing to press in? How much are we willing to give up? Oh, I know this is old school. Come on, somebody. How bad do we want this? The formula is no secret. I'm not giving you, I haven't given you anything in this series that was hidden. We already knew it. I just kind of dressed it up a little bit. We already knew what to do. It's just a matter of doing it. God teaches to pray. We need a revival of prayer. In the last message of our series about the revolutionaries, we talked about Jesus' teachings and his behavior and how they were so revolutionary and even controversial. But in that message, we said that Jesus was a friend of, of sinners. How many know Jesus hasn't come to those who 
are whole, but to those who are sick and broken and lost. And that's us. That's us. But even though Jesus was a friend of sinners, can I tell you that he did not allow the sinner to influence him? But rather, he influenced the sinner man. For an example of this, let's go to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verse number 1. We all remember this Bible story from Sunday school. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. He was a tax collector. And he sought to see Jesus, and who he was, and could not for the press, in other words, because of all the people, and because he was of little statue. In other words, Zach was short. Zach was short. And so he ran, therefore, and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see Jesus, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw Zacchaeus and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at your house. And ever since Zacchaeus slid down that sycamore tree, the bark's been falling off the tree ever since, if you know anything about a sycamore tree. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. Hmm. Boy, now that doesn't that just sound like a religious attitude right there? He was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Now, according to I can see here, Jesus didn't even say anything to him. He didn't go to his house and preach a message. It was just conviction of who Jesus was. It was the revealing of truth that changed Zacchaeus' mind. How many times do we try to beat people up with the Word of God if, if instead we would just let our light shine, the love of God shine, the transformation in our heart shine? That's a good point right there. We need to remember that. He said, God, I'm, I'm going to make it right. The half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day salvation has come to your house, for as much as also he is the son of Abraham. For the son of man is to come to seek and to save that which was lost. So here we see that Jesus didn't let the fact that Zacchaeus was a sinner intimidate him. Nor did Jesus allow Zacchaeus to influence him, but rather Jesus influenced Zacchaeus. Everybody shout influence. Influence. Can I tell you right now, you have influence over people you have no idea. You don't even realize you had influence over certain people. Influence. It's so powerful. Jesus wasn't intimidated by the fact that Zacchaeus was a sinner. So then, with that being said, we don't change the message, but the message changes us. Right? We don't change the message, but the message changed us. The message changed Zacchaeus. And I don't think Jesus had to preach so much of a message. It was just a re a re real... Uh, a revelation to Zacchaeus of the truth. Now, we can be like Jesus and we can change the message, the methods in which we deliver the message. And that's what messed the religious people up so much is because Jesus came with these new and different methods. We can change methods, but we never change the message. Right? And so as we prepare to close this message and close out this series here today, I want to ask us a question. And that question is this. How do we create a culture of revolution? 
How do we create a climate of change? First of all, we need to get a revelation of the fact that God has created and called us to do more than what we've been doing. We've settled. Look at your neighbor and tell them, we have settled. We have settled in America, in the church. We have settled for so less than what God has called us to do. Secondly, we have to take ownership of this. And we need to admit that we have missed the mark. Hello? How many know sometimes if you want help, you got to admit that you need help? If you want to recover from the problem, first, first things first, you got to admit that there is a problem. Sometimes we just need to admit that we've missed the mark. Jesus himself said we would do greater things. Not just less than, not even equal to, but greater things. We must allow the Holy Spirit to challenge our ways of thinking and how we see things. When we read scriptures like Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, we must find the faith to believe what we're reading is true. Look at it here in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. How many know that scripture right there seems almost too good to be true? Able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even think. Church, can I tell you it's not enough just to be faithful in reading of the Word of God, but we need to believe what we're reading is true. You can't read the Bible like a textbook. You can't sit down at night and say, well, you know what, I've got to read two scriptures or or two chapters, I've, I've got to get my reading in, and then just blow through it and expect it to change your life. The best thing you can do before you sit down to read is to pray and say, God, please, you and the Holy Spirit, open this book to me. Let it become life to me. So not only do we need to be faithful in reading of the Word of God, but we've got to believe what we're reading. Everybody shout faith. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. We've said it before in this series. So many times we're trying to figure it out in our head when we just need to believe it in our heart. Stop trying to figure it out already. Just believe. Just believe. Look at your neighbor and tell him, just believe. Remember the thief on the cross? Didn't have to go to Bible school. Didn't have to go through a long list of catechism. Didn't even have a chance to be baptized. He just said, Jesus, I believe on you. I I, I believe you who you say you are. And Jesus like, hey, today you're going to be with me in paradise. It's easy to be saved. Don't believe the lie of religion that tells you, hey, you have to do all this. Have to look like this, act like this, dress like this, dot, 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 dot. No, that's religion. We can look the part, but be full of dead man's bones on the inside. Woo, I'm preaching better than you're shouting right now. Come on. Some of the worst hypocrites go to church every Sunday morning. Faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. If you'll remember, there were two revolutionaries in the Old Testament. At least, there were many more. The two I want to talk about today were Joshua and Caleb. Remember how they were the only two of the 12 spies who came back with a good report. Isn't it amazing how 12 men saw the same thing, but two saw it totally different than the other 10? Why is that? It's right here, Numbers 14, 24. They weren't trying to figure it out with their head. They were just believing with their heart. Numbers 14, 24. But my servant Caleb, because he had a what? Another spirit with him and has followed me half-heartedly, followed me fully, him will I bring into the land wherein he went and his seed shall possess it. All because of faith. All because of a good report. (laughs) 
No, I can't sit down and be intellectual with you and explain everything. But I just simply believe it. Right? Look at your neighbor and tell him, just believe it, honey. Just believe it. And so I think it's safe to say that a revolutionary is a person who is full of faith. A revolutionary is a person who, because of their faith, sees things in a different light. Look at this here in Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 1 and 2. Let us therefore fear, least a promise being left us, in other words, an inheritance, great things being left unto us, a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should come, seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Wow. Wow. So as believers, we must take our God-given measure of faith And we've all been given a measure of faith. We're all on the same level playing field when it comes to faith. But we have to take our God-given measure of faith and activate it. And when we read the Word of God, or when we hear the Word of God being proclaimed and delivered, we've got to exercise that faith. God, I believe it. I don't understand it. I can't explain it, but I believe it. Why? Because faith sees the invisible, believes the unbelievable, and receives the impossible. Can I tell you that it doesn't take a whole lot of faith? But it does take faith in action. Remember what Jesus said? If you have faith as a what? If you have faith as what? Look how small that is. If you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you shall what? Speak into the mountain and what? Shall be moved. Pass around that when you're, when you're done with the pastor time. I want everybody to look at that. It doesn't take much faith. It just takes faith in action. Activated faith. Faith without works is what? Faith without works is no faith. It's death. I hope that, hope that builds somebody's faith today. You don't have to have a whole lot of it. You just got to exercise what you got. How do you grow faith? Well, we know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But how do you grow faith? Use what you got. Exercise it. Work it out. How do you build muscle? Same way we build faith. Exercise. So a revolutionary is a person who has learned how to activate their faith. The Bible says the just shall live how? By faith. Revolutionaries see things in a different light. See things that the normal people, normal person doesn't see. Why? Because they're looking through the eyes of faith. A revolutionary isn't someone who is perfect, but a revolutionary is someone who is passionate. Passionate. Everybody say passionate. A revolutionary is someone who's passionate about their faith in Christ, what they believe. We said it, I believe, last week. They overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they love not their life to the death. A true revolutionary is willing to give their life for the cause, for the revolution. A revolutionary is someone who's passionate. And in their spiritual maturity, they have learned how to control their passions, not allow their passions to control them. A true revolutionary is someone who's learned to control their passions and funnel them in the right direction. How many understand God wants us to be passionate? We just got to be passionate about the right things. You say, well, was Jesus passionate? Oh, I promise you, he was very passionate. When he turned the tables over in the temple, he was very passionate. In fact, can I say he was very angry? 
Don't say that, Steve. Jesus couldn't have been angry. Yeah, be angry and sin not. Come on, let's learn the Word of God for what it is. Jesus was very passionate. He was just passionate about the right things. Don't believe the lie of the enemy that you have to be this, woe is me, I'm a Christian, I can't do anything, can't go anywhere, i got to be so boring and religious, pious, look, I've been, look like I've been dipped in pickle juice, miserable, enduring for God on my way to heaven. Woo-hoo! If that's religion, I don't want any. Come on. The Bible says whom the sun sets free is where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Well, religious, religious spirits hate, hate that, don't they? <laughs> God has called us to be free. I believe a revolutionary is a person like David who messed up, very passionate, sometimes passionate about the wrong things, but in the long run, he learned how to encourage himself in the Lord. When he was wrong, when he did wrong, he was quick to repent. Come on, somebody. He was a worshiper. I believe revolutionaries are worshipers. I believe great lovers make great worshipers. Come on, somebody. Hmm. Hmm. You just got to remember where to put your love. Sometimes we're looking for love in all the wrong places. I wish somebody helped me preach this morning. We're looking at old boy. We're looking at old girl when we need to look to Jesus. That's why our marriages are so messed up and so dysfunctional because we're trying to look for fulfillment from our wife or our husband when we need to look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. You ain't going to find it in your wife. You ain't going to find it in your husband. It's got to be a relationship with Jesus. And once you get that relationship right, then everything else is going to be okay. talking about being passionate. We just got to learn where to put our love. Who's worthy of our love? I believe a true revolutionary is the person who has learned how to guard their mind, guard their heart, guard their anointing, guard their calling. A revolutionary is a person who has learned how to properly guard their eye gate and ear gate. What you allow in through these gates called the eyes and what you let in these gates through the ears, right? Let's look at it here in Philippians. We have no idea how much junk we allow into our spirit, man, on a daily basis. Can I tell you every moment of the day, as human beings who happen to be Christians, every moment of the day we are either feeding our carnal old nature, the flesh, or we're feeding our spirit man. Through the TV programs we watch, the music we listen to, the things we read. We're either feeding our our carnal man or our spirit man by everything we do. Here it is, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, doesn't sound like Jerry Springer to me. Doesn't sound like cable television to me. Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, what? Think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, do them, and the God of peace shall be with you. You know, so many times in the charismatic Pentecostal church, we're looking for the greatest, the latest revelation. And that's all right, I understand. I'm the same way sometimes. But can I tell you, everything's been revealed already. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. We know the way. We know the truth. We know the life. And who is he? Jesus. 
We know the rule book. We know the formula. What is it? The Word of God. The problem is we're looking for something easier. Don't throw anything at me. We're looking for the easy road. There is no road of least resistance in the kingdom of God. Crucify your flesh. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. Deny yourself. That's where our power comes from. That's where our strength comes from. Our strength comes from when we're down on our knees. I know, this is old school. A revolutionary is a person who has realized the price they have paid for their anointing is too costly to trade in for a moment of weakness or passion or pleasure. How many know sin can be fun for a season, but the wages or the paycheck of sin is what? Death. I don't know about you, but my anointing is too costly. Pay too much of a price for this thing, honey. Come on. A revolutionary is a person who has learned how to renew their mind. We find it here in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. But be transformed by how? The renewing of your mind. Where's the battle? In our mind. Can I tell you, if we win the battle of the mind... We win the whole rest of the, the war. We win the battle of the mind. We win the whole rest of the war. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'm here to tell you we can't have the mind of Christ. I said as New Testament, born again, spirit-filled believers, we can have the mind of Christ. We can be led of the Spirit of God. And so many times we're, we're, and don't get me wrong, I believe in all this stuff, but so many times we're, we're, we're waiting for revelations and dreams and we're putting out fleeces and we're, well, God, if you'll do this, if you'll say that, if you'll confirm it 16 times instead of 15 times, I'll do it. If you'll speak to me 21 times instead of 20, I'll go. The sons of God are to be led by the Spirit of God. Right? It's like using that old age-old excuse, well, I'll pray about it. You ain't going to pray about it. That's just an excuse. We already know what to do. There's so many things that we don't need to pray about. Just go do them already. Church, just be the church already. Will the real church please stand up? We got one revolutionary here this morning. Can somebody say thank God? That's all we need, honey. Little as much when God is in it. Never been in the majority anyway. Never been in the majority. Always called a minority. Don't mean that the way it sounds, but... Huh. Boy, I think that might be prophetic. I think God just spoke right there. Did we hear it? The Lord gave me a word a couple weeks ago about unconventional. Unconventional. We had an unconventional service a few weeks ago over at West and on a Wednesday night, and I was like, God, this is unconventional. He's like, yeah, but it's me. Do you want me? And I said, okay, come on with the unconventional already. I believe God's going to do unconventional things in un unconventional ways through unconventional people. Why? Because God wants to do extraordinary things through ordinary people in an unordinary time. My God, help us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And so as we conclude this message in this series here today, let me say this. In this series, we have learned that the church was God's idea. Jesus bought and paid for the church. Remember the scripture, husbands, love your wives as Christ has loved the church. And how much did Christ love the church? Died for it. Gave himself for it. The church was God's idea. The church belongs to Jesus. And if it's God's idea and if the church belongs to Jesus, then guess what? It's his to build. It's his to build. He said, upon this rock I will build my church. That's what he said. He didn't say, upon this rock Steve Owens and Full Gospel Evangelistic Center will build. No. No, he said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not, will not, cannot prevail against it. 
The church is God's to build. And if it's his to build, it's his to defend. It's his to grow. It's his to take care of. It's his to watch over. What do we got to do? Got to take our hands off of it. Got to step away. What do you, we got to allow God to move again. I said we got to allow God move, uh, to move again. We got we to gotta welcome God back into his house again. Come in, Jesus. I know last time you were in here, we had merchants, we had sailing, we had buying, we had all kind of commotion. But come back in, Jesus, please. We need you. Come on, somebody. Does anybody feel that in your heart, in your spirit, man? We need God back in his house. Church was God's idea. We've read it in every message of this series. And I just yelled it and stomped and snorted and spit it at you. Jesus said, Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's why it has to be his church. If it's just a work of man, if it's just an organization, it's going to fail. It's going to miss the mark. It's going to be full of religion. It's going to be full of dead man's bones. Form of godliness, but denying the power of going through the motion. Leaving the same way we came. No change. No change of the heart, no transformation of the mind. Look at your neighbor and tell him it's time for a revolution. It's time for a revolution, and guess who God wants to birth a revolution through? Not your neighbor. Somebody's got it. Is that Brother Dale back there? Me. This is who he wants to birth it through. I'm an agent of change. Look, look at your neighbor and tell him, I'm an agent of change. I'm an agent of change. Hmm. We have learned in this series that Jesus himself was the first church. He was the perfect example. He didn't come to Jerusalem to go down to the local temple and hold a three-night revival. He didn't swap business cards with local temple pastors. He said, Pastor, you come preach at my temple, I'll come preach at your temple. No, he didn't say that. But he brought a revolution to the streets everywhere he went. Who is this man? Let's go out to see him. He was revolutionary in his thinking. He was revolutionary in his teaching. And the religious people hated him. So much so they crucified him. I don't know about you, but that scares me right there. That scares me because I know I've been in the church my whole life, Pastor Tom, and I know that if I'm not careful, I can become religious. There you go. I can become a professional Christian, a learned Christian. And you know what? If I'm not careful, I can fall into that same trap of religiosity where the devil sways you to sleep. Rock a bye, churchy in the treetop. Isn't that where we are? Safe in the arms of Jesus. Asleep while the world goes to hell. But we've got a smile on our face. We've got a suit coat on. I've got my tie on, so everything's good. I know when to lift my hand. I know when to say amen, so all everything's good. I'm asleep. I'm not doing anything Monday through Saturday, but I sure do look good on Sunday. All along, I'm asleep. I'm religious. I'm going through the motions. Come to church. Had a good service. But it didn't really change me. Didn't transform me. And we'll do it all again next Sunday morning. Guess what? That's why we're in the mess we're in. Right? That's 
That's why we're in the mess we're in. How many still love me this morning? Come on, you got to love me if you want to go to heaven. I didn't say you got to like me, but you got to love me. <laughs> I hate religion, but I love Jesus. I said, I hate religion, but I love Jesus. In fact, we don't even know what true religion is. What does the Bible say is true religion? There it is right there. Only the bishop knew what true religion was. It's not what we say. It's not what we do. It's not the church we go to. It's not the clothes we put on. It's not the length of our hair. It's not this. It's not that. I can be so religious on the outside, but be so deceptful on the inside. Why is that? Because that's human nature. And that's why the religious people hated Jesus. They couldn't stand him. And every every time they tried to trick him up with the law, Jesus gave them a greater revelation of the truth. And they're like... Well, you think their eyes would have been open, wouldn't you? Thank God a few were. Remember we said about it last week, Nicodemus? Hid away, come at night. What did Jesus tell him? you got to be born again. It's not through works. It's not through all this stuff. It's not because of that nice robe you put on and go into the temple and do your thing. Relationship. Relationship. That's what Jesus wants. I'm closing with this. If you'll remember, we talked about this in one of the messages. Adam and Eve sinned the first sin, didn't they? Well, no, actually, I take that back. Lucifer was the first one to ever sin, the sin of pride. He was kicked out of heaven. In fact, God took his name from him. You're not Lucifer anymore. You're the devil. But Adam and Eve were the first humans to sin. And before they sinned, They were naked. They had no clothes on. The only thing they had on was the glory of God. But when they sinned, when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they realized that they were naked. And what did they do as soon as they sinned and realized they were naked? They created the first form of religion, went and got some fig leaves and made some clothes and covered their nakedness. Hmm. Here comes God in the cool of the day, desiring that fellowship, that relationship. Adam? Adam, where are you? What was Adam and Eve doing? Isn't it amazing how religion keeps us from God? I'm over here, Lord. Well, what do you got on? Religion. I'm naked. Who told you you were naked? Guess you ate of the fruit, huh? Why don't we have more preaching like this in the church? Why don't we just take off our mask and just be real? It's time to stop being religious and start having a real loving, living relationship with Jesus, the lover of our souls. Jesus was the first church. He was the original body of Christ. And now Jesus isn't here anymore, but what? We are. are. Guess what? Now the church is the body of Christ. We have learned that Jesus' heart, his passion, his intention for the church is to be a house of what? No way around it. If we need to have anything else, we need to have more prayer meetings. Hello? We need to have anything else. We need to have more prayer meetings. Bishop Webb needs to stay in Missouri. Pastor Todd needs to stay in Ohio. We need to have more prayer meetings. We need to birth what God has called us to birth. And it only comes through prayer. 
Listen, we've had more evangelists and pastors and peoples through here in the last few years. If man could have done it, man would have already done it. It's got to be us, and it's got to be God's way. What's the formula for all this? I didn't write it down, but let's go to it. I'm closing. Praise team, you're going to have to come because I'm not wanting to quit. Acts chapter 3. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. I don't have it thumbnailed. I didn't have it written down. Here's the formula right here. I'm closing. Last message of the series is over. This is it. Acts 3.19, 20 and 21. Repent ye therefore. Here's the formula. Here's how we birth a revolution. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When? Everybody say when. Not if, but when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which was before you was, was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive, in other, in other words, keep, until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of his, all his holy prophets since the world began. It all starts with repentance. All starts with, re- with prayer. You say, Pastor Steve, what are, you, what are you saying? Do you hate the church? Are you down on the church? No, I love the church. Jesus died for the church. But we got to get it together, church. We got to repent. We got to admit that we've missed the mark. We've went to church, but we haven't been the church. We haven't been his hands, his feet, his mouthpiece to a lost and dying world. We've looked pretty on Sundays. Maybe throw in a Wednesday here or there, whatever. Special service with Bishop Webb or whoever, you know. But we haven't been the church. You know what we do do instead of loving our brothers and sisters? You know what we do? We criticize them. We judge them. Can I tell you nobody died and made you judge? Can I tell you with the same? Hello. Everybody listening to this right here, listen to me. The same judgment you meet or you give is the same judgment you're going to get in return. That's why I choose the mercy seat over the judgment seat any day. Oh, Pastor Steve, you better deal with that. You better take care of that. You better get on that. No, honey, you better back up. Because the same judgment you judge, you're going to be judged with. That's why I love the mercy seat. Choose the judgment seat if you want to. But guess what? It'll come right back at you. Jesus was so revolutionary in his teaching. Oh, my God, I got to quit. I don't want to quit. We have learned in this series that we're already seated together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. We are in Jesus, and Jesus is in us. And now Christ and his church are inseparable. Where the church goes, there goes Jesus. Where Jesus goes, there goes the church. And guess what? Now it's time to birth a revolution. It's time to birth a revolution. Do we have any revolutionaries in the house today? All the revolutionaries, please stand up. Come on. (laughs) Woo! Ha, 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 ha.